Hey, Rebel Bankers, this is your host, Chris Noggle. Welcome back to the show. I've got a really, really exciting episode for you today, one that is very timely and one that you're going to learn a lot from. And we're going to get into my guest, Harry Dent, and we're going to talk a little bit about markets. We're going to talk about economics. We're going to talk about what Harry does, and, and it's going to be an action-packed show. Before we get into that, folks, I want to talk about you and your journey to on your journey to becoming a Rebel Banker. That journey begins with you getting knowledge, you getting educated on all the things you're doing. But the one thing I always say on this show is don't get so caught up in gathering knowledge that you never actually take action on the things you're learning because knowledge is power, but only if you actually take action. So here's this. I'm going to give you an opportunity to actually show me you're an action taker. If you take action on this, I'm going to give you something for free. And we also have something from Harry that's going to be free to you as well. So any of you that are action takers and you're saying, I always take action. Well, here, put your money where your mouth is, but no money needed on this one. Just take action. Go to chrisnoggle.com. I'm going to give you something for free. You can get one of my two books for free. You can get Mapping Out the Millionaire Mystery or the Private Money Guide, and it doesn't cost you anything but shipping. You just got to swipe up, click the button and it's yours. But also we got one more. Harry Dent has a website and you guys should all go to this. So let's do a round two. Go to harrydent.com and sign up for his newsletter. And I'll tell you something, you're going to need it. You're going to need this information with what's going on. So folks, that's how you take action. So Harry, welcome to the show. Yeah, nice to be here, Chris. I'm excited to have you on and there's a lot to unpack and talk about, but real quick, can you just tell everybody a little bit about yourself, what you do? I mean, you've got such a long bio, best-selling author, one of the most outspoken financial educators in America. You've created proprietary research using economic studies. You've done so much. It's better if you just tell everybody what it is you do. Well, you know, the, the real short story is that I, I majored in economics and quit on, quit on the third course in undergrad. Then I went to Harvard Business School and really, and, well, I studied accounting and finance and then and, and marketing and strategy, everything else, and went to Harvard Business School and then came out consulting to Fortune 100 companies, the Bain & Company. And then my major move started consulting to new ventures where I learned a lot more, especially about the demographic trend coming down the road in the early 80s, which was the gigantic baby boom. So I basically came up by working in the real world with large and small companies and learning everything about business instead of economics, which is useless from what I found, I learned and built my own macro indicators for the economy, which are very simple, like you know, generational generations grow up in a predictable manner and spend more money until their peak spending at age 46, 47. How simple is that? And that will tell you when the economy is gonna boom and bust for the decades in advance. Um, inflation is not caused by monetary policies, only a little bit it's caused by unproductive young people first entering the workforce, which the baby boomers did in the late 70s, causing the highest inflation and on and on and on. So I have long term cycles that then converge at key points. And this is one of them where my most important long term cycles are coming together. And I also do technical analysis like like short term traders have to do to refine short term. That's that's a whole different science. That's probabilistic. It's best guess. What I do is deterministic. My long term cycles happen because they're baked in the cake. The baby boom stops spending at the end of 2007, as I predicted, 20 years before with my, my simple indicators, and we've been living off a of quantitative easing ever since to make up for that void until the millennials drive us up and they don't drive us up until 2023 forward. So we got a few more years of downturn and my big cycles say the biggest downturn since 29 to 32 started in 20, but is gonna hit between 21 and 22. So, so this is a big deal and, and, and man, for, for people and more short-term traders, you guys know downturns happen a lot faster and a lot more profitable than, than upturns if you see them coming. Absolutely. I mean, you couldn't have said that any better. And, you know, this is our space. This is what we do. We're financial and money educators teaching people about this. And for far too long, I've been talking about these things, but sometimes it falls on deaf ears because people see what's right in front of them, but they don't look just that little bit further. I'm an avid studier of history and you nailed it. Like I have studied the Great Depression, the years of the 1926, you know, to 29. And then what happened after? And I got to tell you something from what I've studied, 
what I've read using that time period, using the dot-com crash, maybe sprinkle on a little 2007 and eight, what we have coming is frightening. And that is the only word I can use for it. But nobody seems to believe that because we're in this modern monetary economic theory where all they do is print money. That money just makes everybody's lives easier. It pumps it in. But they don't understand the repercussions of that. My listeners need to understand what you know. So how can we best sum up what potentially could be happening in 2022 or 2023? We can't really nail the time, but we can kind of see this pattern. So what potentially could be happening soon and how would people go about getting ready for it? Okay, the biggest cycle in stocks, which is crystal clear if you go back like you did, even farther to when the stock exchanges started and the industrial revolution and free market capitalism and democracy, the big bang was the late 1700s. Ever since then, major super bubbles in stocks every 90 years, like a clock. 1840 to 42 crash and the greatest depression for the Great Depression, then 29 to 42, and now 2020 to 2022. So this is right on clock. My generational cycles boom and bust about every 40 years. Baby boom, 1983 to 2007 up, into the downturn 2008. It doesn't bottom until 2023, which means the stock market should bottom just ahead of that in late 2022. Look back at 40 year cycles, 1942, 1982, and and just ahead late 2022, the biggest bottoms in any of our lifetimes. And so we got the biggest bubble peaking now, going into the biggest downturn cycle. So what you're saying is, is there could not be a bigger cycle. We will not see, and I've been saying that, I've been predicting this for decades, not just recently. The bubble happened and went even more because of quantitative easing. But the biggest cycle down is here. And we will not see something like this for for the rest of our lifetimes, most of us. So this is a big deal to happen. And real quick, what is the magic number here? Quantitative easing is a new tool that instead of just lowering interest rates and fiscal stimulus to keep a debt economy going like they did after the 32 crash and only after, they say, no, we're just going to print money and offset the downturn. If it goes down this much, we print this much. Oh, COVID? We print, they printed as much in eight months as they did in 80 months yes. to save off the baby boom downturn. This is crazy. You don't get something for nothing. Here's the penalty of that. Nobody's getting. Oh, we already had the biggest debt bubble in history. Oh, that's no longer the big penalty. What they've done by printing money, the money has not gone to consumers and businesses, has not increased inflation or economic growth beyond 1% to 2% and we wouldn't have had that, it's gone into financial assets. The new number is, the biggest number in the world, $520 trillion in financial assets, stocks, real estate, bonds, all that sort of stuff, versus 200, half that, 253 in debt, uh, 90 trillion in M2 in, in, in the world, all currency, and only 85 trillion in global GDP. Financial assets are over six times global GDP. Normally, it's two, three tops. So we've got the biggest bubble in history that has to deflate. And a lot of the experts say, well, Harry, yeah, yeah, we got problems. But but hey, we, we don't have all the debt defaults we had in 2008. Oh, we will. But that's not the big problem. Since then, they blew up the financial assets more Do you know how fast, of course, any trader knows, how fast can financial assets deflate overnight? You know how long it takes debt to deleverage like in the 30s? Years of chapter seven and chapter 11 and negotiations and bankruptcies and companies winding down and acquiring each other. This thing is going to happen faster and harder because to avoid the debt deleveraging of the 30s, which we would have been more healthy for the economy. Get this bad debt and zombie companies out of the way so we can grow again. They inflated financial assets, at least make the wealthy feel better and spend money and stave off the downturn. And they've created the biggest monster in history, $520 trillion, which at a minimum, folks, and just hold your breath for two or three years, is going to see at least $200 trillion, 40%, like in the early 30s and probably more, disappear And that's going to cause the biggest crash and the biggest deflationary scenario in history. And it's going to be worse, if anything, than than the 30s downturn. Now, you, you're far you know, better at telling that than I did. But you know, we just did another episode where we talked about this and I had a bunch of traders because obviously that's the world we're in, the, you know, the, the financial world, the education world. And we were talking about like where everybody thought this was going to happen. And it's so 
comforting. Well, it's really nothing comfortable about what we're talking about, but comforting to know that you said that because that's exactly where we had it pegged based on what we're seeing and based on the past. Because listen, a lot of people think, oh, these are unprecedented times, maybe in some cases, but not really. Like this has happened before. It will happen again, not in our lifetimes, but it's about to unfold right before everybody's eyes. And the problem is, I feel like everybody's blind right now. People are not preparing for this. I don't see many people at all getting ready for what could happen. You know, squirrels before winter, what do they do? They go out and they gather they nuts. nuts. And what, yeah. yeah, they store them, they put them in their cheeks, they put them in the trees, they get ready for the winter, the storm. Nobody's getting ready unless you think buying a flat screen TV is getting ready. And I'm not saying that to kind of, you know, make fun of anything, but really like, what should people be doing? if? We could go back before the Great Depression and warn people, what would we have told them to do then? And what should people do now? Because everybody has an excuse. Well, if I put money in in cash, I got to worry about the dollar devaluation. Very true. If I do this, I got everybody's got an excuse today. But where does the rubber meet the road? And what would you say are the best things people should be doing right now? Okay, first thing real quick, as you said, this has happened before, bubbles in 1929 stuff. IPOs, you look just back at, at the dot coms and the IPO thing there. They came out at the late part of the tech bubble, bubbled the tech bubble even more because they were crazy overvalued and then crashed 95% when tech crashed 78. You got the same thing, Bitcoin and crypto is coming at the end of this second. So we got a second tech bubble 20 years later. That's another cycle I have, 20 year cycle tops and bottoms, and and getting ready to crash even more. And the Bitcoin bubbles even more extreme in this tech bubble. So, I mean, what do we see? We just saw the same things happen. We saw um, Airbnb and DoorDash come out day one, double their value. And I thought that happened right in February, January, February for that te- dot com bubble burst and stuff. So all the same. Oh, and GameStop. I mean, oh, my God, it just track, that's why I was late to this point. Tray, um, <laughs> Range in one day when you got too much liquidity and now there's this war between the the smaller traders and the big traders and, and, and it's about time somebody kicked their ass by the way. I agree. Um, and, and but but look what happened. I mean, this is signs of a bubble getting ready to burst. There's too much liquidity. Things have bubbled up too much. The only way to get all this craziness out is let the economy. We don't need a structured thing. Let the economy deflate this bubble in two or three years. It'll it'll balance income inequality. It'll get rid of a lot of debt and bad companies quick. Financial assets will come down to, to sanity. And then, then millennials can invest in the future. Millennials can buy a house cheaper and all this sort of stuff. It's, it's what we needed in 2008-9 and they didn't let happen because of quantitative easing. So second thing, what do you do? Very simple. Because when you see a bubble of this magnitude, all financial assets have bubbled up, okay? Even ones that aren't on cycle. So everything crashes. So there is nowhere to hide. People say, oh, I don't have a balanced portfolio. No, try that in 2008 and 1929, 30, right? No good. Everything crashes except the highest quality long-term bonds and the strongest currencies. Guess what the strongest currency is? I don't care what gold bugs say, oh, US printed too much. We did everything wrong. Europe did it 50% worse and Japan did it three three times worse, okay? We're in China prints condos instead of money. That's way more. They different. do too, up in Toronto. They're just printing condos up there. Yeah, it, it's just crazy. I mean, and that that creates a an oversupply deflation scenario guaranteed. So so you have to, it is is not going to be inflation like the gold bugs say. We're in a winter season. We're in a deflationary season like the 30s, not an inflationary season like the 70s. And I have cycles for that that are crystal clear. I tell people you couldn't create 10% inflation, nevertheless hyperinflation, even if you printed $50 trillion when they've already printed 20. You can't because you, you have people have to borrow that money and multiply it and everybody's over in debt and can't do that. So it's deflation. Deflation is going to favor the dollar as the best um, currency in the world and still the reserve currency, not for long, but for this crash. It's going to favor the best bonds like the 30 year treasury bonds Absolutely. and the 20 year triple A. You even buy AA or A, you're going to get some default risk and you buy B and C, you're going to get crucified like stocks. You buy the safest stuff. They go up in value. 
The safe haven there, the safe haven is not gold. Gold is an inflation hedge, not a deflation hedge. Like in 2008, it may, it may edge up in the early stages of this until Lehman Brothers or something goes bad and they see deflation. Gold crashed 33% overnight when it saw that it wasn't going to be an inflationary crisis. And the gold bugs are going to be dead wrong, right about the crisis, dead wrong about it being an inflation crisis. It's going to be deflation. You look at history in developed countries, nine out of 10 at least major financial crises are deflationary because deflation comes when you're, when you're deleveraging excessive debt and, and, and bad companies and deleveraging financial asset bubble. Remember what I said, 520 and 200, 250 trillion disappears. That's called deleveraging. Disappearing money means less money chasing the same goods and financial assets and everything deflates. So you have to protect your money. Cash is good, high quality bonds, which you lock in even as like say, it sounds ridiculous. I'm gonna lock in a 1.8, 1.9% 30 year treasury bond yield. Well, who cares? It's low. No, if those go to zero, guess how much those 30 year bonds go up? At least 40% in capital. Absolutely. And let me, let me pick up on that. I mean, this is something that I know a lot about, but like, I really love what you're saying. The wealthy, I've studied them for almost a decade now, actually a little over. I've studied billionaires and multimillionaires, what they do with money, what big institutions do. And, you know, who's the number one purchaser of treasuries outside of the government? Who's the, I guess you would say, second number two purchaser of treasuries in the in this country? Or oh, in the country. I mean, it's well, let's say in the world. Let's say in the world. It's the same. Japan. But here, yeah, I'd say probably wealthy people. What, what what institution is the number the number one purchaser? You got me there. Giant mutually owned insurance companies. That's what oh, they always yeah, have what, done. They have to be in the safest stuff. Bingo. They have to. And, oh, oh, and, so, and Chris, as you're saying that, guess the only financial sector that did well in the 30s. Was I, the oh, I already know. I already they know. bought the safe stuff. Bingo. Absolutely. And it's going to happen again. It's already happening before people. People a lot of times don't understand that the big mutually owned insurance companies are the tried and true tested ones. They make it through every time. Matter of fact, they don't just make it through recessionary or depressionary periods. They thrive folks, because they got all the money, they got the liquidity, and they have the ability to buy these assets because that is just what they do. They understand what you're saying. They understand that it's not about the interest rate they're getting, because obviously that doesn't excite yeah. them right now. It's about what's about to happen. They already know this. They just look at it. Look who, who's buying treasuries. And you might say, oh, they're so stupid. They should be buying stocks. They know what's coming, folks. For, for hundreds of years, back to the Rockefellers, the Rothschilds, you could go right through history, wealthy have put their money in mutually owned insurance companies. And well, that is- thing, Chris, because I work with a lot of high-end financial planners all the time, and the richest clients to tell them, especially now in a bubble, I don't, I'm not looking for you to make me a lot of money. I'm make, looking to you to not lose my fortune. Absolutely, and, capital and, preservation. And so they have that same bias, like the insurance companies, they don't want to gamble when they're already super wealthy. It's people who want to get wealthy, the nouveau rich, that want to ga gamble, and they're the ones that jump in these bubbles. And, and I'm telling you, Chris, people are going to get slaughtered in this one. And oh, my gosh. You're right. It's... Nobody expects it. And no, me and Robert Prechter are the only kind of main, you know, major newsletter writers that are saying the same 90-year cycle meets this 40-year downturn, greatest bubble in history. And everybody's saying we can have a soft landing. And I always say, you find me one, it doesn't matter, stock bubble, real estate, anything that went up this exponentially and had a soft landing. If you fi find me one in history, I will kiss your ass in public because you <laughs> I will love not. love it. Oh my gosh, this is I've so good. It doesn't exist. <laughs> Bubbles always burst. And again, what's the problem with the Fed? They think they can control this. No, the debt problem was bad enough that can default, but these they've created a bigger monster here that it's going to roll them over like the cockroaches they are. But they're not looking out for that. They're just trying to get more votes. So just disregard right. what they're they doing. Any better. Look. Forget about that. Like they're just trying to get votes. They could care less about what's coming as long as they get what they need. And that is what they're doing. They're buying votes, folks. Like everybody sees this happening and it, it just comes down to, 
like you're saying the same thing. You know, I, I'm a bit, I follow James your record. You know, he's talking about def deflation, a lot of similar things. If you just connect the dots, you can see what's coming, but a lot of people just don't want to accept it because it looks so good right now. The stock well, let market. Let me give you another one. Go Chris. ahead. Go ahead. People are not stupid. You know what they are in bubbles? They're high on the bubble. Everybody's mm -hmm. getting a free lunch. Their stocks are going up. Their real estate's going up. They're borrowing money at, at 3% for a mortgage instead of 6%. They're getting car loans at 2% instead of 7%. Everybody's high. Nobody wants somebody like me or you to tell them, oh, by the way, this is a bubble and they always end badly. And, and they, they, they're blind because they're high. People who are high on a drug, crack addicts, heroin addicts, alcoholics, you name it, never make good decisions because they're high. Well, I hope after this we we get back, and it probably won't happen, get back to Austrian economics where it just allows things to happen the way they are. But I don't I don't see that. I, what do you but think? Do you think we'll ever get there? Hand do its work. Don't micromanage the economy. See, I got another great cycle, Chris, and this is the big one, 250-year major revolution cycles. First one, Protestant Revolution took down the Catholic Church, which controlled everything by then. The second one, American Revolution, started to take down monarchies. Now we have none, and the ones that are in England are just movie stars without sex appeal and then don't do much else. And now guess who are the monsters today? The people I'm talking about. The central banks have become the all controlling top-down monsters that fight the invisible hand that Adam Smith said was the best way for the economy to grow. Right. And I still agree with him. He's the only great economist in history other than me. I love this. Oh my gosh. So I am, I said this in the beginning, but I am going to have to ask that you come back on for round two of this, because this is just such good stuff. And one of the other things too, that like you said in there, but I want to kind of just for my audience, help them understand, you know, everybody hears this, like you can believe this or not. You can just study history and understand what's about to happen. You can bury your head in the sand, or you can rise up and be the light in the darkness that you were born to do. You have to make a decision, draw that line, decide what side you're going to be on. Cause there is, is only two sides. If you're going to be the light in the darkness. You need to understand what is going to happen and how to prepare. We talked about some things, mutually owned insurance companies, buy treasuries, buy the safest assets and be very careful what is safe. Understand what he said about gold, because that is very tried and tested. And there's some big names out there, not going to mention them that are saying buy gold. And that's probably a big mistake. So that, get your money in these safe assets. But don't worry about missing out. We're in a potential, like everybody's a gambler these days because you said they're all high. They're high on this bubble. You think you're missing out on something. You know what you're missing out on? The ability to take advantage of the real opportunity, which is just a, a few short years away. Imagine if all you did is you went into capital preservation mode today when things are actually still good and going up and you just took it all and you just, you said, you know, I'm just going to, I'm just going to park it and save things. You're not going to make much. Then all of a sudden this does happen and folks, it will. And when it does, guess who's in power? Guess who's in control? You are because you're ready to take advantage of the opportunity that, that is going to be the real one. And you can do what so many people did back in the Great Depression. You can literally create whatever future you want if you prepared. But so many people will not prepare, will not be ready. And unfortunately, welcome to Niagara Falls. I live here in Buffalo. Niagara Falls isn't far away. That's a mighty, mighty powerful thing. And that's what the economy and the markets and everything's going to look like coming soon. Folks, decide what side you're going to be on. You can bury your head or you can be the light. Harry, th this has been fantastic. And in respect of your time, real quick, I want to talk about this newsletter, harrydent.com. We're going to put that in the show notes, folks. You all need to get this newsletter and read it. Forget about my books, okay? Read his newsletter. Then if you really like it, then get my books. This is a priority. You need this, folks. Your family future relies on this. Not just your future, your kids' futures, their kids' futures rely on the decisions you make today. Get the knowledge you need and take action. Gary, do they just go to your website, harrydent.com? Yeah, harrydent.com. Now, this is our free newsletter. It's a weekly newsletter that comes out once a week. We keep you updated and based on stuff. And for people who really like what we're doing, uh, we have paid newsletters that go in more in depth. So that's the way. Get to know us for free. And I'm saying get to know us quickly because I think we're on the verge of this crash starting literally now or within weeks, possibly. So There's no way we're not. Look yeah. at the chart. I mean, just stock traders like us. If you look at the charts, folks, this is this is the start. It already actually, matter of fact, we're in my opinion, we're already there. You just well, well, don't also, know it Chris, yet. Real quick, 
that the succession since the uh, January 2018 peak, every correction has gone lower. Every, every new high has gone to a new lower low. The next projection, just later in months, even though the whole thing may be down 80, 90 percent in the end, the next uh, crash is going to be 40 to 50 percent, depending on the sector. That's the most opportune crash to actually short or get out of the way up is probably coming up just in the next two to four months. Oh, well, that's the side we're on right now. And we just, the reason I was late is we were doing a thing all about that and how a lot of people just say that word easy, short, short, short. They don't understand what it actually takes. It's pretty hot in the kitchen right now. We've been shorting GameStop and that that whole squeeze we've been going through. I hope, you know, if you're going to short, you better be ready for what that means. But that is going to be the massive opportunity among many, many more. So, Harry, thank you so very much for coming on. Your, your expertise is something that more people need. And I am going to do my part and push this out so that we can help at least save some people from this upcoming thing and allow them to get on the right side of that that line in the sand secondarily folks i talked about you all taking action i'm an action taker you know what i'm going to do the moment this is done i'm going to go in and i'm going to pay for the newsletter i'm going to the free newsletter great i already know i need this i'm just going to pay for the newsletter and get it because that information folks you couldn't pay enough money for that. So folks, if I'm doing it, you need to do it and you need to get ready. The storm is already here. It's not coming, folks. You just heard it from one of the world renowned people out there talking about this. And it's just a matter of who are you gonna listen to? Harry, I look forward to the next, next episode we get to do and thank you for your time. Okay, thank you, Chris. You're welcome.